Hello, folks. It is just after 11 o'clock, so let's get started with our webinar today. For those of you who haven't seen this space before, I am Martin Daly. I'm the Director of Water Quality Programs for the Capital District Regional Planning Commission. Today's webinar is CDRPC's Local Government Workshop webinar, Wetland Conservation, What Do We Have to Lose? Uh, joining us today is Laura Haiti from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. She works in the estuary program. I'll give a brief introduction to this session in just a moment, but first I gotta get to the housekeeping. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, the CDRPC is a regional planning and resource center that serves Albany, Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Schenectady counties. Uh, we foster intergovernmental, intergovernmental cooperation, communicating, collaborating, and facilitating regional initiatives and using other big words that I'm having trouble pronouncing today. We work with partners to help them address regional problems. We established this webinar series to help planners sharpen their skills and as a vehicle for planning board and zoning board of appeals members to obtain their credit hours. Now, planning and zoning board of appeals members uh, are required by state statute to look at that, I'm blocking my camera with my cheat sheet. Uh, required by state statute to obtain four hours of training per year, uh, town, village, and city zoning board of appeals members and, and county planning board of appeals members, as well as um, the planning board members uh, need to, I'm totally off script here, need to, uh, need to uh, ob obtain their credits and submit them to their municipality for approval. Uh, municipalities have a wide latitude in what credits they will accept um, for the training. After this session, you will receive an automatic email. If you joined us via computer and registered with an email address, uh, you'll receive an automatic email that provides a summary of the session, and you can submit that to your municipality for those credits. For our AICP planners, we have submitted this for one hour of CM credit to the APA. Um, so it, when you log into the APA website, just use some of the keyword phrases uh, associated with this session, you'll be able to find that. Um, our attendees join with video off and are muted for security purposes, but we really wanna get you engaged in this discussion. So there's a couple of different ways you can ask questions. Either you can type the whole question to the chat box and I'll relay that, or just type a note, I have a question. I'd like to ask a question along the way. Uh, and much like a radio DJ, I will open up the microphone uh, and uh, get you to ask a question of Laura here so she can share her expertise with you. So um, I think that's gonna work out quite well. We did that for our last session and it seemed to get people engaged in the discussion and, and really build for a vibrant program. Today's topic, uh, today's presentation will be archived. If there are presentation materials, we'll archive them on the Eventbrite page. A link to that will be provided as a PDF. Also, we, um, we record these sessions and we post them to YouTube. A link for that will also be on the Eventbrite page. Same place you used to sign up for the webinar. That's where the archive materials are located. Today's webinar will provide you an introduction to the diversity of wetlands in the Hudson Valley and the benefits they provide for clean water, wildlife, and climate adaptation. In many planning situations, wetlands are viewed as notations on a site plan. This webinar is designed to bring wetlands to life and expand understanding of their complexity and value to our communities. Municipal approaches to wetland conservation will also be discussed. We're joined today by Laura Hetty of the New York State DEC Hudson River Estuary Program. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Laura. Laura, thank you for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, let's get my slides shared so we know that's all working and then I'll get started. So are you able to see my slides? I can see them. And we'll put it in presentation mode then and hopefully you see the full screen. All right. Great. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today on this exciting uh, pre-snowstorm pre uh, morning. <laughs> um, and thanks, Martin uh, and Capital District Regional Planning Commission, for inviting me to present today um, and for making these educational opportunities available to communities and decision makers in the Capital District and uh, beyond. I'm actually interested in where you're all from. So if you're comfortable using the chat box, maybe take a moment and write um, the county or um, where you live or volunteer or serve. Um, and if you're on a planning board or zoning board or elected official, maybe add that as well, just to get a sense of who's in the audience today. And I'll take a look at that. Oh, great. Um, they're starting to pour in here. Yeah, great. And it's also helpful that way you get a sense of using the chat box too. Um, yes. yes. 
So as Martin said, um, my name is Laura Heady, and I'm going to be giving an introductory presentation on wetlands. And I'm hoping it might shift the way you think about wetlands or perhaps enhance your understanding. Um, I am a biologist. I've been working on conservation planning with municipalities and land trusts and other partners in the Hudson Valley for about 18 years. And, and with the uh, you know, end goal to achieve conservation of natural areas and biodiversity in the estuary watershed, including of course wetlands. Um, and that's how I'm gonna be framing today's talk. I just wanted to put it out there right off the bat. I'm not a wetland scientist or a DEC regulator um, and I'm not involved in the regulatory program. So please keep that in mind, um, particularly during the Q and A. Um, okay, and so one of the reasons though that I started conducting outreach on wetland conservation is personally motivated because I just love wetlands. I always have, and um, you know, since I was an undergrad in college um, and took my first wetland ecology class, I think they're one of the most interesting habitats on the natural landscape. And I did serve on a planning board um, for a couple of years in the village of New Paul's, and and just from that experience and working with municipal officials, I found that during typical planning reviews. Wetlands are often regarded as a feature on the site plan that might be considered a nuisance by some, requiring regulatory attention, but with very little understanding or um, you know, inquiry into their complexity or their variety or um, their value. And wetlands are incredibly productive. They're really critical for us having clean and abundant water. They provide habitat for a diversity of plants and animals. They provide wonderful opportunities to hunt and bird watch and enjoy nature. And they contribute to our visual scenery. And I would actually say to maybe coin a new phrase, they contribute to our audio scenery as well in terms of the soundtrack of frogs and toads and ducks and birds that we hear when we visit wetlands. So um, let's see, I'll give you a little introduction to the estuary program. So I'm from the Hudson River Estuary Program through a partnership with Cornell University's Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. And at the SRA program, I coordinate our conservation and land use team, which includes two additional staff that some of you may have met before, worked with Ingrid Haeckel and Nate Nardi Cyrus. And so we're part of the Hudson River SRA program, which is a unique uh, program within the New York State DEC. We were established to help people um, enjoy, protect, revitalize the Hudson River estuary and its surrounding watershed. So we work throughout the 10 counties. Hopefully you can see my cursor on the map. Um, and those that we work in those 10 counties that border the tidal portion of the Hudson River from uh, Upper New York Harbor to the Federal Dam in Troy. And we're doing that work to achieve um, many key benefits, including clean water, community resilience to climate change, the vital estuary ecosystem and its fish, wildlife, and habitats, natural scenery of the river valley, and also to provide opportunities for education, access, recreation, and inspiration on the river. So for a quick look at the geography of the estuary, if you're not that familiar, uh, on the map on the right shows the watershed of the estuary in green. And this is the land that drains into the tidal portion of the Hudson River. And it's that tidal portion of the river that is referred to as an estuary, if you're not familiar with that term. So the river is actually tidal all the way up to the Troy Dam. That's 153 miles of tidal river, uh, which usually has two high tides and two low tides in every 24 hour period. And so the decisions made in municipalities throughout that watershed area have the potential to either support or impact the natural resources that make the Hudson Valley such an incredibly special place. And that is why our program offers grants and technical assistance and outreach to communities and decision makers uh, like yourselves. And for those of you who are new to the work of our conservation and land use team at the Estuary Program, or if you're interested in conservation planning, I encourage you to visit our new website. Um, the web address is at the bottom of the slide on the right. But this new website reflects the planning approach we've been um, helping communities and land trusts and other partners pursue for the last 20 years. And that is using current science-based data uh, and uh, conservation principles to make informed land use decisions and to pursue proactive planning that protects priority natural areas, wildlife, and water resources. And so 
This includes helping communities with natural resource inventories, open space plans, incorporating natural resource information into comprehensive plans, um, developing proactive planning board practices and so forth. And it's this kind of proactive, larger scale planning that we encourage that can take some of the burden off planning boards um, by shifting away from trying to you know, protect nature one parcel at a time at the site plan level and instead thinking more holistically and more proactively about the community's conservation goals. Um, so uh, the website is there and also you could always just Google conservation planning, Hudson River estuary watershed and you should get to the site. So for, today, for today's talk, um, I'm going to just start with some introductory information about um, how we define wetlands, what they are, give you a little mini exploration of some of the diversity of wetlands in the Hudson Valley, but then also share with you some resources on where you can learn more about the different wetlands in your community or your county. Um, give a little bit of an overview on the value and functions of wetlands, talk about the threats and also what wetlands are protected and which ones aren't. Um, and then end with some tools for conserving wetlands um, locally. So let's first start with what is a wetland? You know, there are different purposes in defining the term wetland. Um, and I'm guessing you're most familiar with definitions meant for regulatory purposes, um, for example. I'm gonna speak more broadly about um, the wetlands definition that really relates to their ecology, um, which, and that definition also informs regulatory definitions. Um, so this, let's see, this is from the DEC um, website and it really captures the three defining characteristics of wetlands. So wetlands are areas saturated by surface or ground water, uh, sufficient to support distinctive vegetation, adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. And so those three characteristics are really key uh, in thinking about describing defining and identifying wetlands, water, vegetation, and soils. So first let's start with um, hydrology. So hydrology really refers basically to the wetness of a wetland. Um, wetland areas are periodically inundated where they're actually holding um, standing water, or they might just have saturated soils that are saturated up to the ground surface at some time during the growing season. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual refers to the inundation or the saturation of soils for only 5% of the growing season in most years. So if you're on a planning board or an environmental commission and you regularly conduct site visits and you're looking for wetlands, you should not assume you're looking for water. Um, but you can learn to identify indicators that there has been presence of water at some point. Um, things like the soil saturation, but also um, leaves that are stained from having been underwater for some period of time. You often can see watermarks on trees that um, indicate there's been some standing water at some point. There may be deposition of um, debris or sediment or drainage patterns that suggest that there maybe was an outflow of water or uh, leaving the wetland or perhaps there was um, standing water that then receded. And so you can look for those indicators to kind of help you know, um, even during times of year when there's no water, that there has been water in the past. There's also other characteristics um, in addition to water, and that's soils. And hydric soils or wetland soils are formed under conditions of saturation, flooding, um, ponding of water long enough during the growing season to develop very low oxygen or anaerobic conditions in that upper part of the soil. And that, that's where you often see there's a lot of organic matter at the top um, layers of the soil profile. Like you see in this photo, you can see all that really rich, uh, mucky, uh, very organic soil at that top layer. And so wetland scientists will use a soil auger to get a sense of what's in that soil profile. And then finally, in most wetlands, uh, the plants that grow are able to tolerate prolonged saturation and the associated low oxygen conditions in the root zone. Um, the term hydrophytic vegetation uh, literally translates to water loving, 
um, it might be more accurate to say water tolerant plants, um, but they have developed adaptations that enable them to thrive in wet, low oxygen conditions. Uh, for those of you who grow house plants, you've probably witnessed what happens when a plant that's not water loving or hydrophytic is overwatered. Um, in extreme cases, the leaves may turn yellow, they may wilt and eventually they may die, the plant might die. Um, and that's because unlike wetland plants, they're not adapted to saturated conditions. So in other words, it's the presence of water that influences the kinds of soils that form and then the plants that grow. And that is how we define and identify and describe wetlands. And it's also why wetlands are different um, from say a dry field or an upland forest. Um, and it's why therefore they can support very different biological diversity, different wildlife, different plants, and also why they provide different benefits to us, uh, to people, um, different benefits than you would receive from other kinds of habitats. So um, I'll talk more about that, but um, all of these characteristics really line up to um, shape what is found there and the kinds of functions that wetlands have. So let's uh, explore some of the diversity of wetlands we have in the Hudson Valley. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, diversity of wetlands, aren't they all the same? Uh, so I wanted to share this statement that I had found on the DEC website some years ago, which I think really emphasizes that our knowledge and understanding of wetlands has increased in the last 30 years, as has our technology that we use to map wetlands. I'll just go ahead and read this to you. <clears throat> the old perception that all wetlands are marshy and have open water has been placed in a new context. We now know that only about 14% of our wetlands fit this cattail marsh with a duck image, which is like the photo on the right. Uh, most of our wetlands are actually shrub or forested swamps and many lie along rivers and streams in the floodplain riparian zone. In the past, many of these critical wetlands were missed in the mapping process. And so uh, the New York State freshwater wetland maps, most of which were created in the 1980s, are known, well known to have inaccuracies and they've missed some of this diversity as captured in the statement. So this kind of serves as a reminder that meaningful wetland conservation really requires taking a deeper look than relying solely on regulatory maps. And it also requires recognizing that there are wetlands that might not fit the stereotype that we had for many years. So let's explore um, some examples. And I, I can't get into detail on all of the wetland types in the Hudson Valley. That could be a whole hour long webinar. So I'm gonna focus just on a few examples and I'm gonna focus on non-tidal wetlands that you probably encounter most commonly. And, um, but just to give you a sense of some of the range of wetlands, in terms of the ones we see in the watershed, you know, inland away from the river, these non-tidal wetlands include everything from our different kinds of wet meadows to uh, some of our um, kind of smaller, more isolated wetland types like woodland pools and bogs to then some of the more forested wetlands. But I did wanna point out, even though I won't be talking about them, that there is an incredible diversity of tidal wetlands as well in the Hudson River estuary, um, portion of the, you know, the Hudson River. And these include the tidal wetlands at the lower reaches of the Hudson down by New York City, where we're actually getting a lot of salinity and salt from the ocean that's reaching up into the, um, the river. And, and then as you move further up, um, you know, north in the river, we're getting more brackish conditions where salt and freshwater are mixing and we see more brackish tidal wetland types. And then eventually up by the Capital District, we see freshwater tidal wetlands, which when I first moved to the Hudson Valley, I, it took me a moment to wrap my head around what that meant because I was used to tidal always being salty. But really it's those freshwater tidal wetlands that are so unique, they're considered globally um, uh, of significance. And we see things like freshwater tidal swamps in the upper reaches of the Hudson. So um, if you're interested in that, um, there are different resources where you could learn more about that. But like I said, today, I'm gonna focus on our non-tidal wetland types. So I'm gonna first start um, with our more open wetland habitats that don't have a closed canopy. And so first we have um, wet meadows, which are often kind of a, what we call a successional stage or a transitional kind of habitat type. 
And they're the results usually of disturbance like a wetland, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, a beaver flowage. So beavers that um, block streams often cause flooding areas that will kill off the trees and shrubs that are there eventually resulting in a meadow. But these meadows also can be maintained uh, through grazing. Wet meadows are often part of pasture land. They can be maintained through mowing. Um, even deer browse um, can help to keep these meadows open without having that woody component of shrubs and trees. So um, they're dominated by, you know, by definition, they're dominated by what we call herbaceous vegetation. So grasses and um, forbs or, and, or wet wildflowers and rushes. And you know, when you look at this, this uh, wet meadow, you could imagine, I mean, there's kind of a dead giveaway here that it's wet because when I took the photo, there was purple loosestrife in bloom. But in a different time of year, this might look just like a dry field without any obvious sign that it's a wetland until you walked through it and felt that kind of lumpy, hummocky soil underfoot. You might see water oozing up from the soil as you walk through the meadow. And if you're familiar with plants, you might look more closely and recognize wetland plants like uh, reed canary grass, soft rush, some of the wetland goldenrods, um, which are all maybe a little bit more subtle than the obvious purple uh, loosestrife growing in summertime. But these wet meadows, um, you know, support a lot of diversity of invertebrates like dragonflies and butterflies, as well as common species um, uh, like red-winged blackbird, pickerel frog, and um, also woodcock displays are often in these wet meadows. And then they also support some of our rare species like bog turtle. One of the concerns about wet meadows is that they can easily be overlooked, again, because they don't always look uh, wet. Um, they're often too small to maybe be captured on maps. Um, and they're also vulnerable to changes in hydrology in the surrounding area because they're often um, receiving groundwater input. So if groundwater uh, flows are altered, that might affect the ability of these uh, meadows to stay wet. So, Laura, so that's our first. Uh, yeah. Sorry to, sorry to jump in. I no to worries. Um, we had a question, and, and I believe this may be part of, of your discussion, um, but can you discuss the importance of wetland buffers and different methodologies in protecting them? Uh, yes, when I get to conservation strategies, I'll talk awesome. a little bit about that. I had a feeling that. it was and, in there. <laughs> yeah, but if I don't get too deep into that, um, maybe we, you could remind me. <laughs> okay, um, all right. On. Yeah. I'll be the, um, uh, hopefully that person will follow along or... or yeah. Uh, and I'll make a note to myself more sunlight also. sunlight on something. Okay. I'll make a note to myself as well. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so this is the first of the kind of more open wetland types I wanted to share. Um, but next is what is that more stereotypical wetland type, which is emergent marsh. So this is a photo of what we call an emergent marsh where plants are actually emerging through the surface of the water. Um, in this case, this photo I took during a very wet time of year and it's extremely um, high water level. So it's a very flooded emergent marsh and it really um, illustrates how marshes can be a powerhouse in storing water. Um, like the wet meadow, marshes are dominated by herbaceous vegetation. So not a lot of shrubs or trees, but more of this kind of, um, uh, you know, cattails, pickerel weed, in some cases, phragmites, if um, there might be some invasive species. But what's different about the wet meadow, in addition to the taller vegetation because of the water levels, it's also that marshes often have standing water through much of the growing season. So as a result, they're important for a number of aquatic species, turtles, uh, a lot of marsh birds that are of conservation concern, um, muskrat, different frogs, and um, and some of the threats to emergent marshes include things like runoff, contaminated runoff from roads or surrounding, um, you know, maybe faulty septic tanks. There's also concern about um, invasive species introductions, which is true for most of our wetland types. So then thinking about um, as we kind of move away from this open wetland type to something with more of a closed canopy. And I'm guessing swamps is something that you encounter quite a bit in your planning and conservation work. So people often use the term swamp uh, in reference to any wetland, but the term swamp actually refers to a specific kind of wetland. By definition, these are wetlands that are dominated by trees and shrubs. So species like red ash, red maple, um, in some cases, hemlock, um, white pine, and so forth. 
that's more of the forested wetland. There's also the shrubby um, swamp, which might include species like dogwood, um, alder, blueberry, spice bush. Um, and these, both these shrubby and forested and mixed shrub and forest wetlands are referred to as swamps. They may or may not have standing water. I often use the example of a wetland about a mile from my house here that I drive by frequently and it looks just like an upland forest until springtime when the forest floor is covered with skunk cabbage. It's like a green carpet of skunk cabbage. I never would have guessed it was a wetland if it wasn't for that wetland plant growing there. So uh, this, this photo I took has standing water, but sometimes it might just be kind of hummocky soil that um, shows that at times the roots have tried to pull up out of, the, out of water, but there may not be water there all the time. And as I mentioned on that slide I showed from the DEC earlier, these forest and wetlands were often overlooked during mapping, um, and, and a lot of our wetlands are these forests and wetlands or swamps. So keep on the lookout for those when you're um, undertaking planning reviews. Laura, when we talk about mapping, you had mentioned yep. that a lot of the old wetland maps are, are inaccurate. How can planning boards accurately protect or get more information on what is, what isn't a wetland? Um, oh, I'm going to show, I'm going to share some resources for identifying wetlands. That's another, that's another standby. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's coming up. Okay, um, excellent. And yeah, so let me just share one more wetland type and then um, okay. I will get into resources that can be used for finding wetland types. So the last one, um, which for those of you who know me, know it's one of my favorites, if I was to pick a favorite, and that, are, uh, that is a, the woodland pool. And woodland pools are also in forests, but unlike swamps that often have streams flowing in or out of them, woodland pools are isolated. They um, usually sit in a little depression in the forest. In Massachusetts, they may refer to them as wicked big puddles um, because that's what they look like when you're in the woods. Um, and because they don't have a constant source of water, they dry up in typical years and therefore can't support fish. So without fish, they are um, excellent breeding and nursery habitat for a very important group of amphibians that live in the forest, including spotted salamander uh, in the photo on the top and wood frog, um, which is in the photo on the bottom. And um, their egg masses, their developing larvae create this incredible amount of biomass um, for the food web in the forest. And uh, these wetlands, so while they look insignificant like a big puddle, they actually are often compared to like the coral reefs of our northeastern forests. So these are often overlooked because they are so small, they're generally not mapped um, and might require site visits to find, um, but it's really important for you to be aware of them. So getting to Martin's last question, um, in terms of how to um, uh, learn about different wetlands and identify where they are, I wanted to share a few different resources, both for learning about different wetlands and also finding where uh, map resources are. So the first um, is the New York Natural Heritage Program's conservation guides. I'm guessing if you're involved in planning, most of you are familiar with the New York Natural Heritage Program. For those of you who aren't, it's a partnership program between the DEC and the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, SUNY ESF. Um, in addition to doing a lot of research and really important conservation work, the Heritage Program maintains the state's very comprehensive database on the status and location of rare plants, rare animals, and natural communities or ecological communities. So these conservation guides were designed to support information, um, to provide supporting information to people uh, like you to help you learn about these different uh, biodiversity um, uh, uh, assets that we have. Um, these, you know, these, this amazing biodiversity we have, especially in the Hudson Valley, but across the state of New York. And so there are guides to animals um, and plants that are, have rare status in New York, but they also um, have this uh, community guide section. And if you look on the screen, you can see I've circled community guides. They have 151 different, different ecological communities that they describe, um, both terrestrial or upland communities, as well as wetland communities. So you can use the search function um, and in the search box, there's an advanced search option. If you were to use that, um, you can um, get this window to open that has some options for what you wanna search on. And if you were interested in finding out all the different wetland types in your county, you could um, select ecological communities in the guide type. You could choose the county. In this case, I'm using Columbia County as an example, and then hit submit 
And you would then get um, uh, a list of all of the ecological communities. You could do the same thing for rare plants and for rare animals. In this case, there were 19 different ecological communities that the heritage program tracks in Columbia County. I've indicated all of the wetland types in green. So there's four on this page. And on the next page, there were another six. So there's 10 different wetland types in Columbia County tracked by the heritage program. So you might look at this and say, well, what the heck is a rich graminoid fen? What's an inland calcareous lakeshore? So you could click on each of these and, and it'll open up a profile just on that community type. So I'm gonna choose shallow emergent marsh. And in addition to describing the um, rank and the state and federal protection status, you can also read a summary. You can read about conservation and management strategies, uh, the range of this habitat type in New York, identification guidance and additional resources. So um, what I would recommend if you're involved in planning and you know you have particular ecological communities on a site that you're reviewing, you could use these guides to not only inform your own decision making, but you could also share the information with um, a project sponsor to help both of you be on the same page in terms of what you know about the ecology of the site. Oops. Um, Another way to find out about the wetlands you have in your community is through local natural resource inventories. Um, if you want to learn specifically about wetlands and other natural resources, um, I encourage you to find out if your town, city, village, or county even has a natural resources inventory or NRI. So here are some examples from the capital districts. Columbia County um, has a countywide NRI. Um, here's some examples of municipal ones. There's towns of East Greenbush and Queemans have recently completed NRIs. Also last year, the city of Hudson completed um, an NRI. And so um, these can be extremely important and helpful resources because they have maps of all different natural resources, including wetlands, as well as descriptions of the resources. And Unless your community has customized local wetland mapping, the NRI may not contain anything different than what's available online or through the national and state wetland programs. But the NRI is more convenient because it's, it's focused on your own municipality or county. And along with the wetland features, it also has um, all these other resources maps. So you can see how wetlands relate to other features, um, such as watersheds, large forests, drinking water resources and so forth. Because really, while we might think of wetlands as discrete features during planning reviews, they really are a part of a living patchwork of resources and it's really helpful to think about them in that way. So if you don't have an NRI, I suggest you consider developing one for your community. Um, the New York State General Municipal Law gives municipalities the authority to create conservation advisory councils, which can be very helpful resources to the planning board and in the law, it says those CACs, those conservation advisory councils are meant to create an NRI. So opportunities, if you don't have either a CAC or an NRI might be something worth considering to add to your informed uh, and proactive planning. Finally, uh, in the absence of a municipal or county NRI, or in addition to your local NRI, you can also use our, use our Hudson Valley natural resource mapper. It's an online interactive mapper. Um, it has more than 40 data sets. You can search by location or you can just zoom in to your area of interest. Uh, here's the website in the lower left um, or you can just Google Hudson Valley natural resource mapper. And this is not meant to be used for regulatory reviews. It's more meant to be exploring the different kinds of biological and other natural resource related data that's available to us. And, and my colleague Ingrid Haeckel has been really great at making sure updated and new data sets are added to the mapper. Um, but just to show you on the left hand side, we can see a list of um, different uh, categories of data that if you click on each of these, you can open up a menu of viewable data sets under each of those topics. But of course, today I'm going to focus on wetland layers. If I was to click on that, I would see what's available um, for wetland types. So in addition to the state freshwater wetlands um, from the state maps, which again, we know are inaccurate, in addition then also to the National Wetlands Inventory or the NWI maps, which also have inaccuracies, there's also wetland soils. 
Um, and these are possible or probable wetlands based on soil drainage classes. And those include um, very poorly drained wetlands, poorly drained, I'm sorry, very poorly drained soils, poorly drained soils, and somewhat poorly drained soils. These soil drainage classes are often indicative of where wetlands are probable or possible. So while none of these wetland data sources are complete or 100% accurate, together uh, they can help you learn about the types and locations of wetlands in your community. And if you want to dig into how to use the mapper, we have some recorded uh, webinar trainings about the mapper on our website. And then, of course, if you want to learn more about the regulatory programs related to DEC, um, uh, the Freshwater Wetlands Program, there's information on the DEC website, both about the title and freshwater wetland regulatory programs, as well as freshwater mapping um, uh, uh, for the state. And then finally, for those of you in communities on the tidal uh, Hudson up on, you know, on the shoreline, um, I just wanted to share with you just a couple of resources related to tidal wetlands, um, one from the Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve, that's the Sustainable Shoreline um, website, which shares management techniques related to nature-based shoreline um, um, treatments, and then also to Scenic Hudson's uh, Protecting the Pathways project that looks at how tidal wetlands, which, you know, you figure a tidal wetlands up against some kind of upland area, um, but as sea level rises, these tidal wetlands will potentially in some locations be inundated. So they kind of looked at where is their upland areas that these tidal wetlands can migrate inland as sea level rises. And so there's some mapping information uh, related to that, um, uh, to those conservation priorities that are needed to help these migratory pathways um, stay intact to allow for sea level rise. All right, Laura, so yes, perfect timing. We to, could, to we had a pause. question. Um, yep. What would be a long-term effect if a wetland area should be ignored by a planning board? There are several legal and uh, environmental uh, impacts, but do you yes. want to kind of summarize what those could be? Sure. Well, I feel like you've, I feel like you, you were just <laughs> like tipping me off for talking about values and functions of wetlands. Yeah. So what are the things we could lose? We could lose the values and functions of, um, of the particular wetland in question. And um, so Maybe I'll, I'll dive into that now and then mm -hmm. see if that um, answers the sure. question. Yeah, and I, I think there's uh, also legal ramifications of ignoring a wetland. Well, that's certainly going to be, yeah, like I said, I mean, that's not, I'm not uh, a DEC attorney or regulator, mm -hmm. so I can't speak with authority about that. And it also would depend on whether your local municipality has its own law as mm -hmm. well. Um, but, um, but thinking more about the functions and values, we we could lose, that's what I was gonna kind of frame in this section and invite everybody on the webinar to think about this question. Like what is at stake if we don't plan proactively to conserve wetlands? Cause that's really what I'm trying to encourage is not just thinking about wetlands parcel by parcel, site plan by site plan, but instead thinking more proactively. So what do we have um, to lose? So wetlands um, and other natural areas really provide these tremendous resource or tremendous uh, functions that we benefit from. Everything from water quality and quantity to flood control, moderation of temperature, storage of carbon, uh, provision of clean air, um, opportunities to recreate and so forth. Um, and all of these are called uh, ecosystem services. You've probably heard that uh, expression. Um, it's also simpler to think about them just as community benefits. These are all things we gain um, not exactly for free, but a lot freer than when we build um, build infrastructure to, to deliver these kinds of services. So I'm gonna talk about um, each of these. In terms of, um, you know, if we were to lose a wetland, what do we have to lose in terms of clean water? Well, wetlands help keep water clean and plentiful. Um, they reduce runoff, they prevent erosion. They're incredibly effective at storing floodwaters. They uh, also can filter a lot of contaminants out of water. And so I'll get into a few examples here. This um, illustration shows how that works. You know, here is a wetland sitting kind of on a bench of a slope here on a hillside with water flowing into the wetland and water flowing out of the wetland. And this diagram helps to show that water entering a wetland, it has to slow down as it gets into that kind of level wetland area. And that's really important during intense storms where we see streams 
that are really flowing um, uh, with you know, great velocity, when they hit these wetland areas, it helps slow things down. And whether in a storm event or just in, you know, in normal conditions, the wetlands also help store water. Um, and while the water is stored in the wetland, contaminants and pollutants can settle out. And so the water then that leaves the wetland is cleaner. And this is why wetlands are often used for wastewater treatment. Um, when um, uh, water is being stored in the wetland, whether it's um, uh, being released into the ground, uh, you know, for groundwater, or if it's being released into uh, surface waters, these wetlands are really important for keeping streams flowing, even during dry times of year. So if you are a fisherman or a fisherwoman or a paddler or somebody who enjoys streams, you can thank wetlands for helping keep them flowing, even when we have drier times of year, because the wetlands have stored this water and then slowly release it into um, streams. So here's a kind of real life example of how wetlands have been used to clean water for an important recreational beach at uh, Lake George. There was a situation where there was a real struggle with stormwater runoff into Lake George that was reducing water quality in a very popular swimming beach. Um, in the past, this creek called the West Brook flowed through wetlands um, that naturally filter the water, but those wetlands were filled uh, for shoreline development. So subsequently, years later, the West Brook Conservation Initiative restored those wetlands to reclaim that, those water filtration benefits um, and to restore water quality in the lake. And so here is a quote from the Lake George Association that when the stormwater processes uh, or gets processed basically through the property and flows back into the creek, it no longer carries the pollutants, the sediments and other contaminants that were in the stormwater. And instead they now offer Lake George clean, fresh water, just like nature intended. And it is more cost effective to conserve wetlands than to restore. Restoring wetlands is not only expensive, it's also complicated because you can't just dig a hole in the ground and expect it to have wetland functions. I hope the little tour of Hudson Valley wetlands helped you appreciate that not all water levels are the same, not all soils are the same. Some wetlands are um, filled from surface water, some from groundwater. So there's many unique characteristics that make a wetland what it is. And it's better to conserve our wetlands than to try to restore them. But in this case, we see that wetlands are being used to clean water. From a habitat perspective, uh, wetlands are referred to um, uh, or as biological supermarkets by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they are one of the most protect productive habitat types we have. All levels of the food web are supported through wetlands. Um, they're not only important as you know, foraging and hunting habitat by some wildlife, they're also really important for breeding. And while they support countless common species, they're also, oh, like this great, adorable great tree frog, um, they're also important for supporting, you know, 40, more than 40% of our threatened and endangered species. And, you know, in terms of climate resilience, wetlands are an important strategy in our toolbox for trying to maintain resilience. Um, wetlands, um, wetlands on floodplains and their associated floodplains can really help communities build resilience to increasing temperatures by helping moderate temperature. Um, they can help buffer the effects of sea level rise on our shorelines. They also can help buffer the effects of intense precipitation inland, you know, in our inland um, wetlands by again, holding stormwater, helping uh, reduce flooding impacts and property damage and also storing water that can be really critical during periods of drought. The EPA estimates that one acre of wetland can store a million to a million and a half gallons of water. And that's based on like a three foot water depth. But um, so, you know, in terms of the question about what do we have to lose if we, um, uh, you know, fill or, or, or somehow impact a wetland, I mean, all of these benefits are some of the things we have to lose. And in addition to the kind of the um, uh, flooding resilience and temperature moderation with regards to climate change, wetlands also contribute to um, carbon, oops, whoops, carbon storage. That relationship of wetlands to carbon storage is complex and I won't get too deep into it, but this, this um, diagram on the slide really helps to demonstrate that complexity and also the benefits. So we have everything from carbon storage in terms of 
dead um, vegetation that is uh, sinking underwater and stored in the bottom of wetlands. We have above ground storage of carbon in the um, trees and vegetation. We have uh, carbon stored in the organic litter in the soils, um, the roots of the uh, living plants, the um, peat uh, soils. We also see um, the vegetation in wetlands helping to fix atmospheric carbon through photosynthesis. There's also um, some um, carbon released from wetlands. Um, so both those low oxygen conditions or anaerobic conditions can suppress decomposition. Um, also the acidic soils of like peat, peaty soils um, also will slow decomposition and that helps contribute to carbon storage. But there's also the release of carbon when um, um, some decomposition results in methane releases. But again, it appears that there's more uh, carbon sequestered than uh, released. And um, one way to avoid release of carbon from wetlands is not to disturb them. When we mix up carbon uh, or mix up wetland soils or, or dig around, we can release a lot of that carbon um, or, or also if we re um, remove vegetation associated with wetlands restoring carbon. So again, wetlands are a um, uh, really important strategy in our uh, climate resiliency toolbox. Okay, now, you know, show me the money. What, what, is the, what are some of the economic benefits of wetlands? Why should we care from an economic standpoint? And I like to refer back to this now 10 year old study of the economic benefits of open space preservation that was published by the Office of the State Comptroller. And in it, um, there was this very, I thought, uh, appropriate quotation. In many instances, it's less expensive for a community to maintain open space that naturally maintains water quality reduces runoff or controls flooding, then to use tax dollars for costly engineered infrastructure projects such as water filtration plants and storm sewers. So that's there's that economic benefit of having natural infrastructure as opposed to built infrastructure. There's also an economic benefit that results from our recreation and enjoyment of natural areas of which wetlands are part of. And there's two studies I wanted to share. One is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that um, conducts um, every about five years studies of uh, wildlife-based recreation in the United States. And in 2011, they found that over $9 billion was spent in New York State on wildlife-related recreation. Um, and in a tourism study in the Hudson Valley specifically, not this is based on our region, just in 2017, uh, five and a half billion dollars was spent um, on uh, tourism, much of which was based in, on outdoor recreation. So both from the benefits of water quality and you know, scenic and recreation values and climate resiliency, all these benefits, um, when we think about the charge that's given to planning and zoning boards um, to protect the health, safety and welfare, of your community, and that's one of your key charges, it's extremely important that conservation of wetlands and other natural areas um, be a key strategy. So I'm gonna shift gears now to, to talk a little bit about some of the threats to wetlands, but also then get into what actually is protected. So um, I, I think I've kind of touched on these throughout my talk, so I'll just go through this quickly. In terms of wetland threats, uh, they vary from, uh, changes in that wetness, the hydrology of, uh, of the wetlands from filling, from drainage. We also can see water quality um, impacts from pollutants entering wetlands, whether through um, things underground like leaky septic tanks or leaking landfills um, to surface water uh, runoff that's polluted from everything from roads, lawns, agriculture. Also um, getting to the question about buffers, uh, inadequate buffers can certainly um, create impacts to water quality, can create opportunities for invasives to take hold. This is a photo I took of um, a small wetland that was helping filter water entering this little stream. And there was some ditch management done on the road I was living at at the time. And all this fill was put in into this little, um, wetland adjacent to the stream that was also adjacent to the road. And I can tell you the next time it rained, there was a whole lot of runoff of sediment into that stream. But you know, in this case, this was a little tiny pocket wetland, so it probably wasn't protected. 
Again, uh, climate change, while wetlands help us stay resilient to climate change, wetlands are also vulnerable to climate change because of the potential for drought and intense storms really changing their hydrology. I think wetlands in particular, like uh, woodland pools, are going to be especially vulnerable to uh, climate change and things like drought. I also think lack of understanding um, is a threat, and so I encourage you all to continue learning about wetlands, share what you learn, find ways to empower local planners and landowners and others to make the best decisions possible to support uh, wetland conservation. And so to get into wetland loss, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that more than half of New York State's wetlands have been lost since colonization. Um, in the Hudson Valley, a trends study that was done between 85 and 95 found that 3,000 acres of wetlands were lost, and that was about three and a half, you know, 3,000 acres is about three and a half times the size of Central Park, to give you a visual. But more importantly, if we think about that one acre holding 1 million or more gallons of flood water, that's like 3 billion gallons of water storage potential that was also lost. Um, but also to get into kind of the protections that exist for wetlands, because I think there's a myth that all wetlands are protected. So what does the local role, you know, what's the significance of the local role? So again, I want to reiterate, I'm not a regulatory staff person at DEC, but I do want to take a few minutes to make sure that you're clear on what is and isn't protected. So New York State regulates wetland um, activities in wetlands that are greater than five hectares or 12.4 acres, um, or wetlands that are designated unusual um, of unusual local importance, which is usually related to the presence of a threatened or endangered species. Um, they also protect an adjacent area of 100 feet. Permits are required um, for activities associated um, in these wetlands, and the wetlands to be regulated must be on the freshwater wetlands map. Um, these are all protected under Article 24 of the New York State Environmental Conservation Law. From the federal level, uh, wetlands uh, or regular, uh, the regulated activities in wetlands um, apply to wetlands of any size that meet certain criteria. Um, and generally, the um, federal government does not protect buffer areas. There have been a lot of changes, if you've been following along, uh, in the definition of waters of the United States, or WOTUS. Um, the most recent uh, changes to that really limited the protection of wetlands that are not hydrologically connected to surface waters. So this really left or leaves a lot of our isolated wetlands vulnerable. Um, it's the Army Corps of Engineers that's responsible for federal wetland protection. So the bottom line here is protection is limited. State and federal wetland regulations protect some um, wetlands, but wetlands can also be protected through municipal efforts. And so this is where you all come in. Because uh, what are the implications, you know, if, if, if wetlands are being protected, why are we losing wetlands? Um, uh, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. And um, when the this, this shift to isolated wetland protection decreased so much at the federal level, my colleagues did an analysis looking at all the wetlands that were too small to be protected by New York State and too isolated to be protected by federal government. And that ended up um, equating to over 50% uh, of wetlands in the Hudson Valley are likely vulnerable. So that's where you can come in, in terms of what you can offer in filling in the gaps in these regulatory um, uh, protections. Laura, when you talk about local protection strategies, yep. we from one of our attendees, perhaps a, a mechanism that could be used for municipalities to encourage protection of their wetlands. Um, and they were they asked if there was any consideration or any programs such as a payment for ecosystem service as a way to, uh, to protect wetlands. I'm not aware of examples in the Hudson Valley or even New York in payment of ecosystem services. I know it's an intriguing mm -hmm. idea. Um, and I, you know, I recall a community leader once floating the idea, just like we have agricultural districts, wouldn't it be cool to have some kind of bi biodiversity district where people get somehow um, um, compensated for conserving important habitats? There are some landowner incentive programs that are run through um, uh, some of the national programs, like the, um, I think USDA has some programs that um, can help with um, wetland conservation costs for the local landowner. Um, but in terms of municipal options, I'll go over a few. I'm going to jump through um, some of these um, to get to the more of the policy-related uh, examples. 
but certainly education, 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 both of our community leaders as well as our residents, because if our community leaders care about wetlands, but residents have no idea why they care, their uh, local policy uh, sustainability probably won't be high. Um, I think, again, mapping natural resources, if you don't have them mapped already, is an important step. And then using those resource maps to then set priorities. Again, I'm encouraging more proactive planning um, to, to, so that these decisions aren't left to our local planning boards to make at this very kind of last ditch effort at the site plan level. Um, but open space planning, open space inventories are ways to set priorities based on good data that are on maps. Also ensuring that wetlands are considered early during the planning process, and there's a few ways to do that. Um, you can ensure that you're always routinely conducting a map analysis, looking at some of those resources I shared earlier, conducting site visits, um, recommending voluntary wetland protection to land use applicants, maybe as a way to incentivize or streamline the planning process. Um, you also can use critical environmental area designation to enhance recognition of resources that are important to you, and that's through the seeker process. And one very recent example is the town of Worsing, just adopted two critical environmental areas, one of which was to add, uh, the, you know, importance in terms of environmental reviews um, of this area that is a large wetland complex that has surrounding important upland buffer areas. So that's a way to, to it's not a no-build zone, it's not a law, but it's a way to start bringing more attention to an area of importance. We also right, can get deeper. A, what? Oops, sorry, we had a. I'm 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 trying to pick my spots. <laughs> so sorry. We Go had ahead. A, um, well, yeah. a person who wanted to ask a question. Uh, Ashok, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I apologize if I, uh, apologize if I'm not. I've unmuted your microphone. So if you had a question you wanted to pass along to Laura, uh, now's a good opportunity to do that. Okay, uh, uh, Laura, thank you so much for uh, um, your talk. It's uh, it's very um, informative. Um, I serve on the Conservation Advisory Council in the town of Miskayuna, and you know you've talked about the importance of uh, of, of education, uh, not just at the town government level, and um, but also at the at the resident level. Um, I was wondering if um, if you had any tips or success stories of um, of other towns that have done successful educational outreach efforts, uh, because I think. One of the main things is to is to convince the general population of the importance of wetlands um, and the role they play in uh, biodiversity and how it's important for all species, including humans. And as you probably know, um, doing educational outreach is um, is rather challenging. Uh, so I wanted to know if any resources are available for engaging high school students? Are there any grants available? And are there any, are there any success stories of communities that have done successful, uh, nice community-wide outreach? Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you for sharing your question because you're bringing up really important points. And so I'm going to try to answer the different parts. First of all, in terms of grants, um, our estuary program has estuary grants. Oh, I'm sorry, you're in Iskayuna. I'm not sure if you're in our watershed, but um, for those of you who are, the estuary grants do have um, uh, eligible education projects as one of the project types for environmental education centers and schools. Um, but in terms of what I know some CACs have done, you know, there's, you can partner with local land trusts, for example, to maybe hold a wetland program where you get to actually visit some different wetlands and get people engaged. And, you know, I think um, bringing people out to woodland uh, pools or vernal pools in the springtime is a way to get people really excited about the diversity of life that's there that often are, ne is never seen. Um, also, the town of New Paul's years ago in support of local, trying to pass a local wetland law they developed um, a, a sh about a 20, 25 minute documentary that our program, I provided some technical assistance with, and that's available on YouTube. And I know some CACs held viewings of that video with some discussion afterwards. Um, so that video, it's actually on YouTube. Um, we also have it on DVD. We can share copies of that if you email me or you can just stream it from YouTube. Um, it's called Liquidity, The Value of Wetlands. 
And, um, and that can make, particularly in this time of doing virtual education, that might be a nice opportunity to kind of do a showing of that where people could watch that together and then maybe have discussion afterwards. But I do agree that getting people out to see wetlands um, is really helpful. And if you can hold field trips to local parks and just uh, you know um, help share some of the special features of wetlands, um, that might be you know another way to get people excited about wetlands. And um, if you want to email me, you know I can continue brainstorming about some other ideas. Um, so to wrap up, I just, I guess, getting back to kind of the, some of the policy options at the municipal level, there is the ability to pass wetland laws. Um, I've seen this become a little bit polarizing in some communities. So sometimes some of these softer education or um, softer policy um, options might be better, but for those towns that feel politically ready and your residents are supportive, you can adopt local wetland protections. And there are resources um, to help you with this. The Environmental Law Institute published a planner's guide to wetland buffers for local governments. Um, and uh, there's also more recently from the Department of State, model local laws to increase resilience. And there are uh, model uh, local law examples um, for wetland protection. Another policy option is, is to create a, a, an overlay zone. This has been used in the um, town of Warwick for biodiversity, where uh, any projects proposed in this uh, overlay zone requires a detailed habitat assessment, but certainly this kind of model could be applied for wetland conservation specifically. And um, yeah, finally, just to wrap up then, I guess if, I know I shared a lot of information, um, but I wanted to just take home like four key points. One of which is that no wetlands are the same. We really have an incredible diversity of wetlands and I encourage you to take time to learn a little bit more about the wetlands that you are uh, responsible for in your planning or that you need to review. Um, that wetlands do have tremendous value. They're not just mosquito breeding grounds. In fact, when they're left intact, they're actually very good at controlling mosquitoes, but they have tremendous value. They provide services to our communities. Many are not protected by state and federal reg regulations, more than probably half of our wetlands are not protected. So there is a role for communities and landowners to help with wetland conservation and to help conserve those benefits that they provide. Uh, Laura, so, we, I wanted yeah, to, that's it. to get back to the question about preserving wetland buffers and ways to encourage the wetland buffers be developed. Yeah, not be developed. That for a moment. Yeah, so um, again, that, that idea, if I'll go back to the, um, the example of a local wetland law in the town of Woodstock, where they not only, uh, so they're protecting wetlands that are not regulated by state and federal, right? So, so basically they're protecting adjacent buffer areas for all wetland types. And they have a, an approach where they're using a variable width buffer depending on the, the wetland type. But, you know, these, these local wetland laws can be customized based on your needs. I mean, I know there was a community in Putnam County years ago, they developed a local wetland law with um, a, a buffer width. I can't remember if it was started with 100 feet and then they went and increased it to 150 feet because they recognized the need for greater um, buffer sizes. That's one way. Um, again, you know, you could do something in an overlay zone where if you know there's areas of high wetland value that perhaps those are then given a, a larger buffer area. Um, but again, what's tricky is that um, all of these smaller wetlands that are not protected by federal and state, they are all vulnerable. And unless you think about um, kind of proactive conservation at the local level, um, it's difficult to ma maintain the wetland, let alone a buffer. But I think, again, education is important, you know, getting people involved in maybe re-vegetating um, wetland buffers like we do at streams. That might be a way to, to um, improve wetland buffers, but also at the same time educate. Maybe doing landowner workshops to encourage local landowner stewardship that helps preserve buffers. A lot of times the lack of care for buffer areas might just be because people don't know. And so I think that's again why the role of education is so important. Um, yeah. Yeah. One other mechanism I've seen communities employ is to specifically note buffers in their watershed rules and regulations. Um, because um, though wetlands are a critical part of the watershed uh, and the health of drinking water supplies. So right. Communities that have successfully created 
uh, or successfully identified the value and contribution of not only tributaries, but, but wetlands as well, oftentimes will incorporate those buffers into their watershed rules and regulations and work with the New York State Department of Health and their county, their local county health department to be able to create a set of guidance um, that is a, essentially a mandate that overlays on top of their local zoning in order to ensure that the, the buffers are adhered to. Great, yeah, and, and just to point out too that the DEC's Water Quality Improvement Program grants, WQIP, that's another funding source that can be used for land protection associated with source water. And so yeah. wetlands are also a per, really important um, component of our source water resources. So that um, is another funding opportunity to think about uh, incorporating wetland conservation. Absolutely. And we did have one more question and I, I wanna be respectful of, of time since we're, we're just- yeah, sorry. Mark. Um, we had a question or a, rather a suggestion, but perhaps something you might want to elaborate on um, where uh, personal engagement with the general public from folks that are knowledgeable in, in this field, um, biologists or ecologists, are there programs or are there representatives that DEC perhaps maintains a list of or suggestions as far as giving public talks um, or being able to go out into communities and educate the public about uh, the value of wetlands and programs to, uh, to support them? Um, well, I can say that the wetland program or the, you know, that, or what's known as the Bureau of Habitat at DEC are all, all the staff are incredibly um, busy with just the thousands and thousands of wetland permits that they have to review every year. And so there aren't designated outreach staff. In the Hudson Valley, uh, we're fortunate that the Hudson River Estuary Program, we do have some staff that can share um, some outreach in that way. Uh, I totally agree with you, but I would also encourage you to think about often, even in our local communities, we have experts um, that can be not only providing education, but also a local perspective. There's certainly, you know, naturalists from um, natural history and birding groups. There's land trust staff, there's nature center staff, you know, the environmental education centers that the DEC has um, also could be a source. So the, um, lots of opportunities like that. For those of you in the Hudson Valley, one of the programs I started 12 years ago to try to help residents understand the value of things like um, habitat conservation, woodland pool conservation, the importance of not fragmenting habitat is our amphibian migrations and road crossings project. And that's a project that gets volunteers out helping um, uh, wood frogs and spotted salamanders, other species actually on their migrations when they're crossing roads. And that is an opportunity for people to see firsthand this amazing biodiversity we have that's usually underground that we never see um, mm -hmm. and help them get to these small wetlands and therefore hopefully people kind of feel a little bit more connected. So um, that's something that people can plug into really easily on their own or maybe help organize a local group. And that's on the DEC website. It's the Amphibian Migrations and Road Crossings Project. Yeah, and two, two other opportunities I'll mention. I, I, I thank yeah. you for diving into that. Our, our many counties have soil and water um, conservation yes. districts that are also amazing resources that also administer from USDA as well. So they do have a good um, sense of the pulse when it comes to uh, agricultural impacts on water quality. Uh, and they're often a great organization to reach out to your, your county soil and water conservation district because they have a lot of great, um, they have a lot of great connections in, in the county, as well as if, if your community is, is fortunate enough to participate in a joint stormwater management program. There are many um, uh, stormwater coalitions throughout the state that are working with municipalities in order to maintain their uh, MS4 permits. MS4 permits are a critical way that municipalities protect water quality uh, from being polluted and, and manage pollutant loads in, in their water bodies. Uh, communities under the MS4 permit are required to put together a stormwater management plan and oftentimes these coalitions will uh, go above and beyond to be able to bring public outreach either by discussing uh, ways that uh, homeowners or businesses can lessen their impact upon watersheds or water bodies, but also present information about programs uh, to educate people about the value of the natural resources in their community, the, the streams and tributaries and wetlands. So uh, 
certainly a, a plug for uh, stormwater coalitions and then the county um, soil and water conservation districts are two great resources to reach out to. And there's a lot of overlap in the work that they do, but um, got to include those in the list of folks that are, that are good advocates. I, and I would add to that too, um, in depending on the county and the different priorities, the, um, the Cornell Cooperative Extension offices too sometimes have natural resource mm -hmm. staff that also can provide education. But I totally agree with you, soil and water is an important one to include. Yep. Um, I just put a link in the chat box for a basic fact sheet that kind of summarizes a lot of what I talked about today. Um, that's on the DEC website. And for those of you doing any kind of outreach and education, that might be an, a handout you could use. And um, I also could, um, for those of you still on, I could add the um, the liquidity video uh, link. I did YouTube. it. Oh, you did <laughs> I it? I put the awesome. link to Thanks. it in the chat, yeah. Thank you very much. Google that's search, a, it's in the great. chat. Um, I'll also include a link to that when it comes to archiving this presentation, which we will do um, after the after uh, we wrap up here, if you could send me that, that would be great. I'll add that sure, to Sure, I can send you all the links also, like the buffer awesome. guidance from the Environmental Law Institute and-, and That'd others. be great. Yeah, sure. And uh, we'll also, that's where when the video is done being rendered, we'll also post a, um, a link to the video as well. So folks, if they were, if they missed something, there's a lot of information packed in here. Don't worry, yeah. we will have a link to that video provided as well. Great, I'm finally getting to see the chat box and it's really nice to see <laughs> how folks are really from all over. So thank you everybody I think people appreciated us. it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Laura. Today. Um, I really appreciate the time and, and that you shared with us. Uh, your contact information is on the screen if people have a couple of questions they would like to send to you and we will uh, wrap up. We've reached our times. Thank you very much everybody for participating. We will be back next week where we're talking about planning law. Um, we'll be talking specifically about um, nuisances and, and uh, uh, land uses that don't tend to fit with, with zoning codes. So that'll be an engaging session as well. You can find that from the same Eventbrite page that you use to register and sign up for this particular webinar. So Laura, thank you very much for sharing your time and expertise with us today and have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Good luck with the snow. <laughs> mm -hmm.